Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of 3 Wide. This weekend, the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series is at Dover International Speedway for the Gander Outdoors 400. Overall, this race for the first two stages was pretty boring and pretty bad considering the great racing we've had so far in the playoffs. This race wasn't good in the first two stages and wasn't good in the first half of stage three. But then it seems like Dover saved up all of its magic for the last half of the stage when all the craziness broke out and we kept getting surprise after surprise, wreck after wreck. So if you miss this race and you're planning on watching it later, I was suggest us watching the last maybe 75 or so laps because that's when the action really happened and the first two stages were pretty uneventful where there was no caution except for the stage breaks and just pure domination by Kevin Harvick. So now with all that being said we'll get into what happened at Dover and my three takeaways from the Gander Outdoors 400. Number one, multiple lanes worked. Going into this race at Dover I was hoping that we'd get a race that was like the battle that Matt Kenseth, Kyle Larson, and Chase Elliott had back a couple years ago. So to have racing like that I was hoping that the multiple lanes would work in this race. Multiple lanes worked in this race where guys were running the bottom middle and top to where the guy would take away your line by putting his car in front of you getting your car tight and then you would have to switch lines next to her we needed all the lanes to work so we can maybe get some passing in this race in dover all the lanes were working but there wasn't that much passing throughout the field back in traffic it was easy to jockey for position but it seems like you couldn't really make headway throughout the field even if you had the most dominant car like what happened for kevin harvick now this just has me wondering what happened here at dover today we had all the lines working and all the cars were running throughout the track but you couldn't pass the leader would just be able to do what he wanted do they have to add a pj1 kind of like like Bristol considering I think Dover is kind of like just a bigger version of Bristol or do they have to run at a higher time of the year as we saw from Las Vegas where they would spread out in the past race because it was a lot hotter than the first race or is it something else more than likely probably has to do something with the car but we'll see if the changes next year will improve this race or if it'll just be the same just a little bit slower now on to number two Stuart Haas's demise at Dover for the first race this year Kevin Harvick won the race with Clint Boyer his teammate finishing right behind him in second and their teammate Kurt Busch finishing in the fifth position so it came as no surprise that this race at Dover when Kevin Harvick was dominating, Clint Boyer being right there, and Kurt Busch being there. But they also brought their fourth teammate along with them, Eric Almirola this time. At one point, for a good couple of laps in this race, Stuart Haas Racing was running 1, 2, 3, 4 with Harvick, Boyer, Busch, and Almirola. With the team running 1 through 4, this looked like it could be a landmark day for Stuart Haas Racing where they could potentially have a 1, 2, 3, 4 finish with all their cars. With things to start going south for the team, when Kevin Harvick on one of the last rounds of pit stops went to come in, he got his four tires, came out, and all of a sudden he was slowing down coming into the pits. It was reported that his team knocked a valve stem off, which made him pit again, pretty much taking him out of contention. Then after that round of pit stops, it would hand the race over to his teammate Eric Almirola. Almirola looking to break through and win after coming so close to winning the Daytona 500 earlier this year and coming close to winning earlier at Chicagoland. But as Almirola was leading, his teammate Clint Boyer would have some problems. He would come to pit road after making his final stop under green. The announcers were saying that they think maybe the track bar is broken from Boyer's car, but it seemed like it was a loose wheel that did Boyer in. Because then after they put his tires on, he would go back out on the track and boom, hit the wall, bringing out a caution. This would then lead to pit stops, which we'd have a bunch of different strategies. Now, Marola and Kurt Busch, who were running 1-2, came down pit road to get four tires and fuel, but it seemed like Kurt Busch's team had a weird pit stop where they were gonna do four, but they screwed up on the right side, so they ended up taking two tires because it looked like the guy on the left rear was starting to undo the lug nuts, but then he went off. Now, Marola would stick to his gun to get four tires and fuel. Other drivers who also came down would get two tires, such as Joey Logano. But then we had some other drivers who stayed out, such as Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin. This would then lead to a restart where Chase Elliott didn't listen to Jeff Gordon and actually got a good restart here at Dover and didn't spin the tires. He would go off and Eric Almirola just going all out while going to the tippy top high side trying to make up all that ground with his new tires. He would carry the momentum off of turn two, smack the wall and get into Brad Kitt's last week causing a big one taking out a bunch of contenders in this race. Guys who were involved in this wreck were Eric Almirola, Brad Keselowski, Martin Truex Jr., Alex Bowman which his day would be done with the damage from this wreck and last week's winner Ryan Blaney would sustain some damage when he would slide to right rear of the car into the wall after Martin Truex Jr. came sliding off the track, Laney would keep going on. Now this would put an end to the destruction of all the Stuart Haas cars. Only Almirola and Boyer were involved in Rex, where Boyer was done for the day and Almirola would keep limping on for a finish. He would end up in the 13th position and wondering how he can get a win after being so close to Daytona, so close to Chicago, and so close here at Dover. Now this has me thinking that Almirola would be a great contender at Kansas, the track where he was injured last year in the first race. Maybe he breaks through and gets his win and moves on in the playoffs at that race. Now the other finishes for the Stuart Haas cars were this. Clint Boyer after his wreck would finish in the 35th position. Kevin Harvick would finish 6th and Kurt Busch would finish 5th. Now 5th and 6th aren't bad for the Stuart Haas team but after they were running 1, 2, 3, 4 and pretty much had the trophy sent back to the shop where Harvick, Almirola, Kurt Busch and Boyer were just dominating on the field. To have your cars finish 5th, 6th, 13th and 35th is not a great day for the Stuart Haas team and they're all probably wondering how this could have went better. Now this leads to number 3. Chase Elliott redeems himself from last year and wins at Dover. When everyone was talking about their previews for this weekend's race 
gets to Dover, everyone would bring up if Chase Elliott can get the job done after he came so close last year to where Ryan Newman was in the way and he couldn't get around him and didn't adapt to the top soon enough and Kyle Busch passed him for the win. Now in this race for the most part Chase Elliott was running in the top 10. He finished well in the first stage where he finished in the fifth position to get those points. Then in stage two Elliott would get a penalty before the stage started and have to start at the rear and then he would battle through the field to get up and finish stage two in the ninth position getting those points trying to get into the top eight considering he was out for most of the day and he started on the outside looking in. But then in the last stage Chase Elliott was hanging around in the top 10 top 5 where he pretty much hung around all day and then after the pit stops and after all the Harvick problems Chase Elliott was in the top 5 looking to strike and get his second career win. After the debris caution Chase Elliott would start in the 5th position. He would get up to 4th and looked like he had a long run car just like he had at Richmond and would see if maybe there was a long enough run to where he could maybe get his way to the front. And then we had our Clint Boyer caution which led to pit stops. Chase Elliott listening to his crew chief Al Gustafson stayed out and would take over the lead. Now as most Jeff Gordon slash Chase Elliott fans know Al Gustafson made some weird moves in the past and all of us were wondering how this would work for Chase and maybe just maybe this could have him end up in victory lane. Then you had the one restart where Chase Elliott looks good. He didn't spin the tires. He was fine. He was on his way and then we had the big one. This then leads after the red flag sitting on those cold old tires where he had to outduel Denny Hamlin again. He beat him off the start line, got clear out of turn two. Everyone kept it straight and out of the wall and Chase Elliott would go on to win his second career race and steal one here at Dover. Now with Chase righting the wrong that happened last year at Dover here where he redeemed himself to get the win and didn't get passed on the last lap by a Joe Gibbs Toyota. This has probably me and a bunch of Chase Elliott fans wondering now with him moving on to the round of eight if he can fully redeem himself and get that elusive win that he had last year almost in the bag at Martinsville and get the W there this time around in that nine car. With the 19 probably focusing now fully on that Martinsville car and the other round of eight tracks I think Chase Elliott would definitely be one of the favorites heading to Martinsville and hopefully he can right the wrong and end up in victory lane and get a grandfather clock and punch his way to Homestead. So now putting Dover behind us we'll get into my three things to look ahead to next week for the 1000bulbs.com 500 at Talladega, the wild card in this round of the playoffs. Number one, Logano going for the sweep. As we saw at Richmond in this round of the playoffs, Kyle Busch swept it after he won the first race earlier in the year, and Kevin Harvick looked like he was more than on his way to sweeping Dover here. So now going into Talladega, Joey Logano was the winner last time the cup cars were on the track, and we'll see if he can sweep it and maybe punch his way into the next round of the playoffs. Now on to number two, can anyone steal a victory here? As we've seen from the past two, if not the past three or four races in these playoffs. It seems like the dominant cars have been coming up short. In just the past two races where Dover where Harvick had his pit stop problems and at the Roval where it was just Ryan Blaney in the right place at the right time when the two cars in front of him wrecked. We'll see at Talladega if anyone could steal one. Some candidates I can see stealing a victory at Talladega are Alex Bowman. He won the pole for the Daytona 500 and Hendrick Motorsports is really good on the play tracks. And with Chase Elliott punching his ticket to the next round, Hendrick Motorsports more than likely put all the resources into getting that 88 car into the next round as well. And when at Talladega could definitely do that. The next is Eric Almarola. He's been good throughout this season in bits and pieces and at the Daytona 500 in February we all know he led the white flag lap and coming into turn three would have won the race if he didn't get hit by Austin Dillon wrecking. The other car at Daytona that was really good was Ryan Blaney. He was close and was dominating and then was caught up in a wreck which cost him the victory there. The next is Kurt Busch. He finished second at the first race at Talladega in April and has been looking better at these play tracks and we know the Fords are fast when we go to the restrictor play tracks. Now on to some long shots. The first long shot is Darrell Wallace Jr. We all know he finished second at Daytona in February and maybe he can break through to get his first career win here at Talladega. The next is Casey Kane. If Casey Kane is back in his car, which Regan Smith is currently driving, I don't know if he's supposed to be back or not next week. He ran well in the Coke 0400, and if he just made one aggressive move, he more than likely probably would have won that race. So if Casey Kane's back in the car for Talladega, he's one to watch to maybe break through and surprise everyone and get a win at Dega. And the last is Matt Benedetto. Matt Benedetto runs really well at these play tracks when he avoids the wreck. He was close to winning Daytona, but was then caught up in a big one at the 500. So maybe De Benedetto can send Go Fast Racing out on a high note with his last ride with them at Talladega, maybe surprising the whole NASCAR and racing world by getting the W. Now on to number three, whose playoffs will take a big hit. Going into Talladega, the playoff standings look like this. Chase Elliott's locked in with his win. Kevin Harvick is plus 68 in second. Kyle Busch is in third, plus 63. Martin Truex Jr. is in fourth, plus 36. Joey Logano's in fifth, plus 31. Kurt Busch is plus 21 in sixth place. Brad Keselowski is also plus 21. He's in seventh place. And in eighth, the last guy currently in is Ryan Blaney, who's plus 10 points. And now the four drivers who are currently out of the playoffs and are the outside looking in are Eric Almarola in 9th, who's minus 10 points. His teammate Clint Boyer, who's in 10th, is also minus 10 points. In 11th is Kyle Larson, who's minus 12 points. And bringing up the rear in 12th, in last place, is Alex Bowman, who's minus 34 and looks to be in a must-win scenario from here on out. As we all know, Talladega is a huge wild card where you can either be a hero or a zero. So some playoff drivers could definitely
definitely be feeling good, but one bad move at Talladega could put them in a huge hole. Maybe even the big three of Harvick, Bush, and Truex, who have a bunch of points to good right now. Now let's not forget what Brad Keselowski said at Daytona, where he was blocked by William Byron and he said he's not going to let up and he's going to drive into people now. Let's say he does that and he ends up taking himself out. He could be looking going into Kansas, being in a must-win scenario, where as he sits right now, in the seventh position, plus 21, Talladega does be a huge hole for him. He can maybe walk out of Talladega, maybe even minus 40 for making it to the next round. And let's not forget about a certain number 17 car that could be lurking after what happened at Daytona. So I'll do it for three wide this week. Leave your thoughts about Dover in the comment section below and what you think will happen at the craziness of Talladega or will it be tame? If you liked the video, hit the like button. If you like what I'm doing on this channel, subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.